السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته like the bridegroom's father to be seated. The bridegroom's father, please come and sit in. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa usalli wa usallimu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen, نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون صدق الله العظيم All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our creator, sustainer, nourisher and protector. May the choicest of his blessings and salutations be upon our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, First and foremost, it is incumbent upon all of us to thank Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we gather here today in this blessed masjid for this auspicious and blessed occasion of the nikah that is about to take place. May Allah the Almighty make this gathering a gathering where the angels shroud us with their wings. The sakina, tranquility of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends upon us. And may Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make high mention of us in the seven heavens. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, just take a look around yourself. Just take a look around. Look at the great and wondrous creations of Allah the Almighty all around you. If you were to take the universe by itself, the most grandest in terms of size and uh, you know the way it encompasses itself the universe which contains so many galaxies so many galaxies billions of galaxies out of which the Milky Way galaxy which we are in which contains so many planets and so many celestial objects when you compare the Sun with our planet Earth it's nothing the Sun is so huge then scale down to the planet to the planet Earth on Earth all of these countries, continents, out of which we are in a tiny country, Sri Lanka, pearl of the Indian Ocean, but still very small in comparison to the other countries. Scale further, this locality, and now scale down to yourself. When you compare yourself with this huge creation of Allah the Almighty, we seem insignificant. We are like a speck of dust. But my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, we are the masterpiece of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Allah Akbar. Allah the Almighty, He says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ That indeed, we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we created mankind فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ In the best of forms, in the best of statures, أَحْسَنْ in the Arabic language, it is in its superlative form. The scale is in its superlative form. The best, there is nothing better than mankind in, in creation. 
So we being the masterpiece of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, no doubt we have to have a noble purpose behind our creation, a noble objective. We were not just created, just to while away our lives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our beloved maker, he clarifies that too. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He did not create jinn kind and mankind for any other purpose other than the ibadah of Allah the Almighty, other than the worship of Allah the Almighty. So does that mean that we have to spend our whole lives in the masajid does that mean we have to spend our whole lives in sajda, prostration to Allah the Almighty? There's no other purpose. Ibadah is the only purpose. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, ibadah is a broad spectrum term. Which covers our whole life being in compliance to the orders of Allah the Almighty, staying away from whatever He has prohibited us. This is ibadah. This is how broad Islam is, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. And from all of this ibadah, our whole life being ibadah, if we follow the commandments of Allah the Almighty, sprouts out nikah. Nikah, which is indeed a great ibadah. For my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, nikah, what is nikah? What is nikah? Nikah, in the Arabic language, you have the literal meaning and the technical meaning or the conventional meaning. I'll just try to sum it up. Nikah, in other words, a bond, a dhamm, which means a bond, a, an union between two unknown souls. For I'm sure if we were to ask the bridegroom here, a few months back perhaps, did he even know the color of the bride that he's going to marry? No. Two unknown souls. But by him merely signing on that dotted line, by him merely signing on that dotted line, he and this girl, the, group, the bride, the both of them, they enter into a bond. Into a bond where he takes full responsibility of all of those, that girl's matters. This is the beauty of nikah, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Rum, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا It is from the great signs of Allah the Almighty that He created for you all أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا From yourselves, mates لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Allahu Akbar So that you may find peace and tranquility amidst them وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And He, Allah the Almighty, He is the one who placed between them love and affection. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And verily in this are signs for those who ponder and reflect. So how can this bond become a sign of Allah the Almighty, many respected elders and brothers in Islam? Why did Allah the Almighty have to create us humans in a way that we have to marry, to reproduce? Or the intimate relationship that takes place between a husband and a wife. Why is it necessary? It is from the wisdom of Allah the Almighty. If Allah had wanted, He could have created us like those single-celled organisms. Where we could have reproduced by our own selves. We would not need a mate, amoeba. These kind of creatures, they reproduce by themselves. Single-celled organisms. They don't need a mate. But Allah the Almighty, in His infinite wisdom... He created us in such a way that we need a mate to exist on the face of this earth. We need a mate to reproduce, for the human race to continue, for generations to be born. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, this nikah, this bond is the inception of a family. And the family is the oldest and greatest institution ever known to the race of mankind. The oldest and greatest institution. For it is through this very institution, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, legends are born. Races are born. Generations are born. And likewise, if this institution goes bad, 
if this institution is broken, then the children that come out of this institution are psychologically affected. They cannot be legends. Generations have been destroyed. Civilizations have been destroyed when families are not in order and when families are not upright. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nisa, the first ayah, يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدا يا أيها الناس O mankind اتقوا ربكم Fear and be conscious of your Lord who created you من نفس واحدة from one soul from Adam عليه الصلاة والسلام Adam عليه الصلاة والسلام was the first human being and from him Ahmad Hawa alayhi salatu was salam was created. And from them, the generations and the race of mankind continued. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's first order, fear and be conscious of him. Look at the hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And please remember salawat whenever I mention his name. Anas radiallahu anhu narrates. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal. Man razaqahu allahum ra'atan salihatan faqad a'anahu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that for the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him with an imra'a saliha, a pious, righteous woman as his wife, Allah the Almighty has helped him in regard to half of his deen. Allahu Akbar. Half of his deen is guaranteed. فَلْيَفْتَقِ اللَّهَ فِي النِّسْفِ الْبَاقِي أو فِي الشَّطْرِ الْبَاقِي أو كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ And let that man Fear Allah, adopt a life of taqwa for the remaining half. For the remaining half. So by merely entering into this beautiful union, a person guarantees half of his deen. And for the remaining half, he has to fear Allah, adopt a life of taqwa. So what is taqwa? Taqwa cannot be merely translated as the fear of Allah. It cannot be merely translated as the fear of Allah. Taqwa, the Arabic term, it stems from the root waqaya fi wiqaya, which means to put up a barrier. A barrier to prevent something or protect you from something. So taqwa, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, is that you put up a barrier to prevent and protect you from the ghadab of Allah the Almighty, from the wrath of Allah the Almighty. This is what taqwa is. And where is taqwa based? Taqwa is based in one's heart. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one narration is reported to have said, At-taqwa ha-huna, at-taqwa ha-huna, at-taqwa ha-huna, wa ashara ila sadrihi talata. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he pointed towards his heart, towards his chest, and he said that taqwa is over here, taqwa is over here, taqwa is over here. In another narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, أَلَا وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَ إِذَا صَلُحَتْ صَلُحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ Verily, in a human being's body, there is a piece of flesh. If that piece of flesh is upright, if that piece of flesh is proper, the whole body is proper. But if that piece of flesh goes bad, if that piece of flesh is evil, then his whole body is evil. Allah wa hiya al And verily, that piece of flesh is your heart. Because, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, taqwa is based in your heart. If you want to protect this union, remember my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, this union of nikah was sealed off in the heavens. In the decree of Allah the Almighty, it was sealed off in the heavens. Who is the matchmaker? The matchmaker is none other than Allah. And this bond is something so permanent, so beautiful, that it does not go on even as the kuffar say till death do us part. No. It goes on for eternities and eternities. For this nikah, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, does not end the minute you pass away from this world. No. The only guaranteed relative that you are assured of in Jannah is your spouse. Is your spouse. So this marriage travels even to the next world. The akhirah. Dunya is temporary. It is a transitory stage. It is temporary. Whatever the problems you face, whatever the trials you face in this dunya, every single thing is short-lived. Even the pleasures of this dunya is short-lived. Akhirah is the real thing. That is what we are headed for. That is our destination. 
So, nikah is something that begins in this world, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, and is supposed to travel for eternities to come. So, how are we to preserve this bond? It is by adopting a life of taqwa, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. For if we bring in the taqwa of Allah the Almighty, the fear and the consciousness of Allah the Almighty, we, where we are conscious of Allah at all times, whatever we do, we try to win the pleasure of Allah. Whatever the prohibitions of Allah the Almighty, we stay away. Allah wa inna li kulli malikin hima. Allah wa inna hima Allahi maharimu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that for every king, for every monarch, is a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a guarded and fenced off place where nobody can enter. Every king has a sanctuary. Every president has a sanctuary. Can any of us think of entering the president's house the way we want? It is guarded, fenced off. So likewise, the sanctuary of Allah the Almighty are the prohibitions of Allah the Almighty. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us, that is the sanctuary of Allah the Almighty. If we, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, do not even dare to get close to a sanctuary of a worldly king, if we do not dare to get close to a sanctuary of a worldly president, how dare we think, how dare we even think that we can get close to the sanctuary of our beloved maker? How can we think? Allah the Almighty, He commands us in the Noble Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشًا وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Allah says, don't even think of getting close to zina. Allah did not say, do not indulge in the act of fornication. Do not indulge in the act of adultery. Allah commands us, don't even think of getting close to zina. Scholars mention, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, that we stay away from all means and all ways that lead to zina. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Al-aynani tazniyan zina human nadr. Your two eyes, they commit zina. And what is their zina? Those evil and lustful gazes you cast. This is the zina of the eyes. In another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, along the lines of these words, that a person... If he is hammered on the top of his head with a nail, it is better for him to bear that excruciating pain than for him to think of touching the palm of a strange woman. Allahu Akbar. And the hadith Rasulullah wasallam is reported to have said, when the adulterer and the adulteress are committing zina, they are committing the act of fornication, the act of adultery, Allah the Almighty removes the light of Iman from their heart. Allahu Akbar. Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, my beloved teacher, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removing the light of Iman, there is a possibility, there is a doubt that Allah the Almighty might not return that light back. Allah save us all. Nikah, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, saves you from all of those pits of shaitan, all of those traps of shaitan. Nikah saves you. Rasulullah wasallam is reported to have said, Ya ma'shar al-shabab. Look at who Rasulullah wasallam is addressing. O youngsters, O youth, male and female. Ya ma'shar al-shabab. Man istata'a minkum ul-ba'a. Whoever of you has the capability to marry, financial capability, physical capability, all of that combined, you have the capability to marry, let him marry. فَإِنَّهُ أَحْسَنُ لِلْفَرْجُ أَغَضُ لِلْبَصَرُ For that will protect your private parts from all that is haram and lower your gaze. And look at who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is addressing. The youngsters, the youth. But, to, but today sadly we see, we parents are to be blamed, many respected elders and brothers in Islam. Today... Parents expect their sons specially to come back now that they have paid for their university degrees, their education. They want their sons to come back, secure themselves good jobs, build for the parents a house, give their sisters off in marriage, and only then can he think of his own marriage. Fear Allah in respect to this, my dear parents. Whatever the sin that he commits, during the period that you have prolonged, during the period that you have not granted him permission to marry, your son, your children, whatever sin he commits, you get the full share of it. 
For you are the obstacle stopping him from getting what is halal. Today halal has become difficult, has become cumbersome, whilst haram is easy. The acts of zina are easy. So these people resort to zina. The youngsters resort to zina. Who is to be blamed? Bima kasabat aidikum. You have earned this through your own hands. Likewise, daughters, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, there is a particular age, there is a particular age when they should be, when they should be given in marriage. For when they pass that age, say now they're 30, 35, it's going to be difficult for you to get proposals for them. And they will remain spinsters for their whole life. And who is to be blamed? Who is to be blamed? The parents are to be blamed. The parents are to be blamed. So we need to see that we get our children onto the halal track. And that is onto nikah, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. And finally, just as how we adopt the life of taqwa, the intelligent slave of Allah, the intelligent slave of Allah is the one who studies his enemy. Who is our enemy? Our enemy, our sworn enemy. This sworn enemy to the race of mankind is none other than shaitan. Is none other than shaitan. وَمَن يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَلِيًّا مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ خَسِرَ خُسْرَانًا مُّبِينًا Allah the Almighty He says as for the one who takes shaitan as his friend وَمَن يَتَّخِذِ الشَّيْطَانَ وَلِيًّا مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ He pushes Allah aside and takes shaitan as his friend فَقَدْ خَسِرَ خُسْرَانًا مُّبِينًا He has sustained a clear loss أَفَتَتَّخِذُونَهُ وَذُرِّيَّتَهُ أَوْلِيَاءَ مِنْ دُونِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then asks, So still, do you want to take shaitan and his progeny as your protectors, as your friends in place of me? So the intelligent slave of Allah is the one who studies his enemy. Studies the strategies of the enemy. For shaitan, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, he runs fi majrad dam. He runs wherever blood runs. He runs in your veins. He runs in your nerves. And why does he do that? He runs in your nerves so that he can study you. We are the ones who are foolish. We do not think of our enemy, but why is he studying us? Look at the case of our parents, Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and Hawa alayhi salatu wasalam. Why they were in Jannah? Shaitan incited them towards that tree saying what? Saying what? Now they had experienced the pleasures of Jannah and they were scared that they will lose Jannah. They wanted to abide in Jannah forever and ever, for an eternity. Shaitan, he studied them. He said, go and eat the fruit of that tree. By eating the fruit of that tree, you will secure eternity in this place. By eating the fruit of that tree, you will be able to abide in Jannah forever and ever. How did he know that? It is because he studied them. Likewise, he runs in our dam, in our blood. And he studies what we like and what we dislike. He studies everything and then puts evil tendencies to what he wants. So it is important that we study the traps of shaitan and steer clear away from it, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. One story. This took place during the time of Banu Israel. There was once an ardent worshipper of Allah the Almighty. He used to worship Allah the Almighty day and night. Day and night. I'm just uh, narrating this story to you all to understand what an artful and deceitful enemy we have got. We have to be extremely careful. This worshipper of Allah, he used to worship Allah day and night. Very close Wali from Awliya Allah during the time of Banu Israel. There were three brothers in that vicinity where this man was living, this pious slave of Allah was living. They planned on undertaking a journey. They planned on undertaking a journey, but they had a young sister with them. So they wanted to know, they wanted to keep her in some safe place where no harm would come to her. So they thought, they had a mashura, they had a meeting and they discussed and they thought, where else would it be safer than this man's house? He is the most pious slave of Allah. We know no one else who is more pious than him. So they approached him. They approached him and said, O slave of Allah, O pious slave of Allah, we are planning on undertaking a journey and we have a young sister. 
who is with us, so we would like you to look after her until we get back. He immediately shunned the proposal away. He said, look, I don't want any trouble. This is a fitna. It is not safe for a man and a woman to be alone. Please do something else for her. Make some other arrangements. I'm sorry, I can't do it. And he goes back to the worship of Allah the Almighty. The brothers, they're dejected. They return home. Now, when he goes to pray, shaitan comes into his mind. He says, he whispers now. The waswas. You see shaitan? He has waswas. He whispers now. He whispers into his mind saying, O oh, slave of Allah, you call yourself a slave of Allah. Wives, you're not even taking the responsibility of looking after a young girl. Now what will those three brothers do? They will leave the girl somewhere else. Some harm may come to her. Someone may do some harm to her. Whilst you know that you are the most pious slave of Allah. It is in your hands. Safety is in your hands. You will be able to look after her really well. Why did you refuse? He comes and whispers. So the next day morning he is not in peace. He goes to the brother's house and he says, Okay, fine. You can leave your sister with me, but these are the conditions. She will not stay in the same house with me. I have a, a room or a cellar a bit fa- uh, further away from my house. You go and keep her there. There is going to be no interactions between me and her. The only thing I'll be doing is thrice a day I'll keep food for her outside that cellar. And she can consume the food and stay until you get back. There is going to be no other interaction between me and her. The brothers were all the more happy. They said, we knew that you would come and you're the most pious slave of Allah. Okay, done. They come and drop their sister off in this room. And they leave on the journey. Now, a few days pass and this pious slave of Allah, he goes, he keeps the food outside the door and he rushes away. He doesn't even look, he doesn't even know the color of this woman, nothing. He just leaves the food and rushes away. After a few days, now shaitan comes again. He comes and starts whispering, Oh, slave of Allah, what akhlaq have you got? Don't you talk to a human being? How can a human being live all alone in a prison? You're just leaving the food and coming. What if she's not eating the food? What if wild animals are coming and eating the food? You don't even check on that. How do you know that she has not died out of starvation? Go check, open the door and check. Then he thinks, yes, it's a human being, I have to check. So the next day he takes the food and goes and knocks the door now. He knocks the door. She opens the door, she's shocked. She opens the door and he says, no, I'm, I didn't come for anything, I just came to make sure that you get the food. He leaves the food inside the door now and leaves. Now the habit becomes every day he knocks the door, leaves the food. So he's looking at the girl now. After some time, no, no, no talking, no, converse, no conversing between them, alright? After some time, now shaitan comes again and now he says, you should talk to her, she's a human being, she needs, you see humans, they need interaction, they need warmth, they need some friendship, you don't have to have any bad feelings towards her, just talk to her. So what happens now? He starts talking to her. Now he becomes friends with her. He becomes friends with her so much to the extent they sit and eat together now. He takes the food. He doesn't eat now. He takes the food and goes and sits with her and eats together now. And gradually shaitan works and works and works until my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, one day while she was talking to her, he places his hand on her thigh. And then afterwards, we know what happens. Zina takes place. Zina takes place. And now he is horrified. After the act of zina, he is horrified. He rushes to the worship of Allah the Almighty, where he worships Allah. He seeks forgiveness from Allah the Almighty and completely forgets about the incident. But now what happens? Zina took place, she becomes pregnant and she gives birth. She gives birth to a child. Now shaitan comes to him. Shaitan's mission is not over. Remember, shaitan's mission is not over. He comes and now he works on his mind saying, now a child has come into the scene. What if the brothers come? And what answer will you have? You the most pious slave of Allah, you have committed zina. Kill the child. Destroy all evidence. Destroy all proof. Kill the child. He thinks right. He goes, takes the child by force, kills the child and buries the child in a location. He comes back and worships Allah the Almighty. Shaitan comes again. You think a mother of a child will leave you alone? You have taken the child like a piece of meat and gone and slaughtered the child. You think the mother will leave you alone? When the brothers come, she is going to inform them. Kill her too. He goes and murders her, kills her and buries her in a particular location. He goes back, locks himself in the place where he worships Allah and continues to worship Allah until the brothers come back. The brothers come back happy that their sister must be safe. They come and knock on the door. Oh, pious slave of Allah, where is our sister? Allahu Akbar, you know what happened? 
a very tragic death. She suddenly died, some breakout of a disease. Come, let me take uh, you, you all to her grave. And he takes them to a fake grave and shows them, this is the grave of your sister. They were all sad. They cry and they sit by the grave of their sister because they love their sister or three brothers. They cry and they go back home eventually. And he goes back and starts worshipping Allah. They go back home. Now what does shaitan do? He goes to the brothers. He goes to the brothers that night and he whispers in three of their minds. The next day morning they all get up as if they've seen a dream. The first brother, he, you know what he whispers? He says, do you know what this pious slave of Allah did? He did this and this and this. He committed zina. Then there was a child. He narrates the whole story and he tells them, you go and check in the grave that he showed and pointed you on the fake grave. Just dig and see. He said that she died recently. There won't be any bones in that location. But rather go near that room where he kept your sister. Dig under there and see. You will see the bones of your sister and the bones of the child if I'm lying. The next day morning when they get up, the eldest brother, he shunned the thought away. He said, how can this pious slave of Allah, he would never do such a thing. This is some kind of mischief. Forget about it. Second brother did the same thing. The third brother, he couldn't keep it. He was very close to his sister. He got, got his brothers together and said, what's the harm if we go check? Let's just go and check. They go dig the grave up. There are no bones. They go check the other grave. The bones were there. They find out the truth. They rush to the king. They, they tell the king, you know, this is what took place, this is what happened. The king immediately orders the soldiers, go and capture this pious man and bring him to my court. They bring the pious man to the court. The king says, he is charged guilty, he accepts what, he's, uh, what, what he did wrong. And the king says, you are to be beheaded, execution. Now he has been taken to the gallows to be executed. Shaitan comes now to this man and says, you know what? I am shaitan. I am the one who put you in this mess. But now you do one sajda for me. You do one sajda for me. I'll get you out of this mess. And bring back everything to how it was normal. He was so upset. He lost all of his prestige. He's being dragged to the gallows. Through the town. Everybody has got to know his real picture. He makes sajda. He makes sajda to shaitan. And his soul is taken away. Allah. The pious slave of Allah. Fire slave. But look at what shaitan did to him. Look at where. Shaitan did not leave him with zina. Shaitan did not leave him with murder. Shaitan took him to kufr. With all of these sins, took him to kufr, threw him out of the fold of Islam. He is a kafir. He is going to abide in hellfire forever and ever. There is no chance of Jannah whatsoever. This is the enemy we are dealing with, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. A question that we have to keep on asking ourselves, are we the friends of Allah or are we the friends of shaitan? For if we have taken shaitan as our friend, we have indeed sustained a loss in this world and the hereafter. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, especially in our marriages, it is important that we understand the tactics and the traps of shaitan because he is all out to breaking this unity. He does not want the union to last forever. He does not want beautiful, obedient children who will be pious slaves of Allah. He wants to bring in discord between a husband and a wife. For that is what he is targeting. That is his mission. He wants to make you lose in this world and the hereafter. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, I wrap up today's talk by advising you all to adopt a life of taqwa at all moments and at all circumstances. Whether it be... In the new chapter of your life where you're opening a new chapter, a uh, bond in your life, nikah, or whether you are married and you are in the stages of nikah, whatever situation you may be, adopt a life of taqwa, fear Allah and be conscious of Him at all times. Take Him as your protector, take Him as your friend and you will indeed be victorious in this world and the hereafter. So with that I conclude, may Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this union that is about to take place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them soul mates where they will find peace and tranquility amidst themselves. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them with beautiful and obedient children who will be the coolness to their eyes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our sins, accept all of our deeds. And may Allah the Almighty unite all of us in the gardens of Jannah. Wa akhir da'waya alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.